Presented by Caltech. I am pleased to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Sergio Pellegrino, who is the Joyce and Ken Cressa Professor of Aerospace and Civil Engineering. He holds appointments as JPL Senior Research Scientist and co-director of the Space-Based Solar Power Project. Professor Pellegrino received his Laurea degree in civil engineering from the University of Naples in 1982 and PhD in structural mechanics from the University of Cambridge in 1986. From 1983 to 2007, he was on the faculty of the Department of Engineering at the University of Cambridge where he founded the Deployable Structures Laboratory. He joined the Caltech faculty in 2007 and is the founder of the Space Structures Laboratory in Galset. I would characterize Professor Pellegrino as an engineer who combines art and science to imagine and develop novel and elegant concepts for large-scale deployable structures. His general area of research is the mechanics of lightweight structures focusing on packaging, deployment, shape control, and stability. With his students and collaborators, he is currently working on novel concepts for future space telescopes, spacecraft antennas, and space-based solar power systems. As a member of the NASA Superpressure Balloon Design Team from 2003 to 2016, he has worked extensively on analysis methods for stratospheric balloons. Professor Pellegrino's publications have been recognized through numerous awards, including the ICE James Watt Medal, AIAA Gossamer Spacecraft Forum Best Paper Awards, IASS Suboy Awards, ASME Boeing Best Paper Award, and ASME Mechanisms and Robotics Committee Best Paper Award. Professor Pellegrino has the distinction of receiving a Pioneers Award from the University of Surrey and the Robert Goddard Exceptional Achievement Team Awards from NASA for his contribution to the superpressure balloon development. Professor Pellegrino is an elected fellow of AAAA and a chartered structural engineer. He is currently the president of the International Association for Shell and Spatial Structures and has been the founding chair of the AAAA Spacecraft Structures Technical Committee. In 2007, he was elected a fellow of the UK Royal Academy of Engineering, which named him the father of ultra lightweight expanding space mirrors. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Sergio Pellegrino to deliver the Watson Lecture. Thank you, Thank you, Ravi, and good evening. I'd like to begin this lecture with um, a quick comparison of um, space-based uh, uh, system versus uh, Earth-based photovoltaics. So we are all familiar with ground-based photovoltaics. And let's assume, just for the sake of argument and to use round numbers, that uh, we consider uh, an installation of one kilometer by one kilometer uh, on the Earth. And uh, um, at peak time, uh, there will be an energy flux uh, there and the power of uh, a kilowatt per meter squared. And uh, of course, uh, at night, uh, there will be no power. And uh, depending on the weather, uh, the power uh, will be reduced. And uh, uh, of course, the day and night and season and the cycle um, throughout the year will affect that. Now imagine now uh, a different kind of system. And uh, uh, the system is now going to have um, an intermediary between the sun and the uh, unequal piece of uh, infrastructure on the ground, uh, receiving antenna of exactly the same 
size. But um, uh, this infrastructure that I'll be talking about in this lecture receives a little more power than what we have in the, on the ground because of the fact that uh, the spacecraft is uh, uh, above the atmosphere. And uh, uh, through a process that I'll describe in more details, transmits uh, as microwaves uh, a power density, again, of exactly uh, the same uh, power that we had at peak time on the ground-based system. Now, this system will actually generate eight times more power because of the fact that there is no loss uh, through the day. So that is the scheme uh, that we are talking about, and we are hoping that this factor of eight uh, here uh, can be used to advantage in uh, uh, designing a working system. And uh, okay, well, there are actually many other advantages for this approach. One of the ones, one that is uh, uh, immediately to be considered is that this beam uh, does not need to go exactly here. It may go here and here, wherever power is needed. So we say that power is dispatchable. And uh, um, there are many other applications that can be conceived, but this kind of encapsulates uh, the basic concepts. Now, this concept has been around for a while. And in fact, it was formalized in a paper by Peter Glazer exactly 50 years ago. And uh, uh, this uh, diagram here shows the, uh, the sketch that was pr provided the f uh, in the patent uh, that was published just a few years later uh, by Glazer and describes a system uh, like this. So what you have is a large photovoltaic surface and then some mechanical connection to a, uh, a microwave radiating antenna. So this is the system that was env envisaged by Glazer. And uh, uh, the idea is that this is a possible uh, scheme for this infrastructure. In fact, uh, during the following years, um, uh, many, many studies that have been made uh, have continued to use this kind of architecture. So you begin here with very large photovoltaic surfaces and a steerable antenna uh, here. Uh, here you have a, uh, a hat-shaped um, uh, surface on which a very large number of reflecting mirrors are mounted and all uh, uh, provide uh, electric power to a radiating um, antenna here which is pointed towards the Earth. And other schemes which are somewhat more modular but based on the same type of approach. And uh, uh, just to go over uh, a timeline of developments in this field, uh, we actually uh, begin uh, the story of space solar power with a short story by Isaac Asimov in 1941, in which there is the first mention of a, uh, of a scheme of this kind. Now, of course, we are not surprised that uh, science fiction anticipates reality. That's happened many, many times. And this is just another example. And then second in this list is Peter Glazer's paper that I referenced before. And uh, uh, 10 years later, the AIAA Technical Committee on Aerospace Power Systems wrote a position paper saying this is very interesting stuff. We should be studying it. And then John Mankins, who has been a proponent of space polar, solar power now for many years, became involved. And Jeff Landis at NASA Glenn has written a study, uh, a proposal for a whole scheme. And in the uh, early 2010s, uh, President Abdul Kalam of India became a very strong proponent of this type of approach. And all kinds of studies were done both in India and elsewhere as a result of that. So the story is long, as you see. It's 50 years today. Uh, from uh, the publication of Glazer's paper. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, the research that I'll be presenting today started at Caltech in 2014. And in 2015, Paul Jaffe at NRL actually built a, uh, a combined tile uh, that provides both photovoltaic and uh, RF um, functions uh, and demonstrated that, but with a kind of hardware that is very different from what I will be presenting uh, in this lecture. Now, um, so it's a long history, and um, uh, many, many people have become passionate about aspects of this work. And uh, as we were beginning to work on uh, our 
very lightweight structures. Uh, Bob Silberg uh, wrote an article that uh, uh, used this image, which I think is particularly beautiful and fitting, even though I should tell you that uh, uh, flying carpets are actually uh, much, much heavier than the kind of spacecraft that we would like to build. Think in terms of aerial density. And, uh, uh, but this captures in a very beautiful way what uh, uh, we would like to do. Now, um, I would like to uh, say immediately that uh, what I present is the work of a very large team of people, and in fact, three professors at Caltech. And so my partners in this research are Harry Water and Ali Ajimiri. And uh, uh, you see us here. Uh, we usually have a great time working together, and this image just reflects, I think, the spirit of our collaboration. Uh, we have been fortunate to receive very large support from the Northrop Grumman Corporation, and we have formed a group of people uh, that work with us, uh, students, postdocs, and research engineers that are helping us realize the vision that I will present. So, um, the concept that we have is a modular concept. So we are not thinking about structures that will be assembled by robots in space, giant structures. No, we are thinking about a large number of structures, uh, identical structures. And uh, so a system, we call it a constellation, maybe on the scale of even three kilometers by three kilometers. I'll have some details later on about some specific designs. And each piece in this system is identical. It's an identical spacecraft, uh, which we envisage at the end of our development to be on the scale of 60 meter by 60 meter. And this uh, modular, uh, this module, this spacecraft is uh, in fact uh, consisting of a series of structural elements that we call strips uh, that they go the full length of the, uh, of the side of the spacecraft. And each uh, of the small elements that you see uh, in the strip is in fact the basic functional element that uh, provides the, uh, the photovoltaic uh, collection and the transformation to RF and uh, transmission through antennas. We call this a tile. So the tile is, in a way, the most basic and fundamental element for what we are going to do. And I will be telling you about the tiles in more detail, because this is one of the key pieces. So, with that, um, let me explain some key ideas. As you notice, uh, this is a system that is very different from what Glazer had envisaged. There is no articulation between the antenna and the photovoltaic surface. There is a single surface, which in this particular sketch here, uh, the antennas are underneath the uh, photovoltaic surface, but it could be done in another way, as I'll describe. And the point is that they are together. They are built together. There is no relative movement. Whereas in the case of the earlier scheme, there was a mechanical connection that could be pointed in various ways. But of course, that created great complexity in the structure that I called a monolithic giant earlier on. So um, what are the key ideas now in realizing a system of this sort? One key thing to realize is that uh, the RF beam, the microwaves, will have to be steered. And steering can be done electronically, as you see here. So now imagine having multiple uh, RF sources here. And to vary the phase of the sources in such a way that uh, the resultant beam goes in different directions, as you see demonstrated in this animation. So one possibility, and in fact, this is what we want to do in order to avoid that mechanical steering, is to provide electronic st steering through phase control. Uh, this can be done very rapidly. Indeed, we could provide power uh, simultaneously or almost simultaneously to different locations on the Earth by beam steering. And uh, um, uh, there are some key uh, parameters that we need to introduce in order to have a, a, a meaningful discussion of the system. OK, so one is the antenna area, the transmitter antenna area, uh, which will also have, uh, which will have an area 80 and a dimension D. That is the, the size of this antenna. There will be a receiving antenna on the ground, AR. There is the distance between these two antennas, uh, which we call D. And then the way, there is the wavelength of the radiation, uh, which we choose, which we have in fact chosen to be 10 gigahertz, and that is a wavelength 
of three centimeters. Now, uh, you can go into antenna uh, textbooks and find some uh, very basic relationships that will tell you the relationship between the power that is received, the power that is transmitted, the two areas of the antennas, uh, the distance squared and the wavelength squared. And this eta, we'll be talking about that, that is an efficiency parameter that we will have to consider. Okay, so this is a key relationship. Then there is an inequality here that tells us that given a distance, um, given a, um, a, uh, a maximum uh, dimension D for the transmitting antenna, big D here, uh, there is this inequality to be satisfied twice the square of that dimension divided by the wavelength, uh, the distance needs to be greater than that. So this is actually telling you that if you're in a particular uh, orbit at some distance d, then there is a maximum value for this dimension, big D, uh, of the transmitting antenna. So actually, this is a way of sizing the system. Given the distance, uh, the orbit uh, in which the spacecraft is flying, we can actually find the value for the maximum size of the transmitting antenna. I'll be using that relationship later. And there is also a relationship that allows us to calculate the area of the receiving antenna such that we catch most of the power that is reaching the ground and there is some power that is lost and we accept a loss of a certain amount of power uh, you will be seeing later on that we aim to capture 84% of the power that reaches the Earth. Okay, next I'd like to make a transition now to some fundamental ideas uh, beyond that of electronic beam steering, which I have already introduced. So the first one is that we are talking about modular systems and ultra lightweight. We will try to make everything as lightweight as possible and combine elements so that the same element actually provides multiple functions in order to reduce weight. Then um, we will set ourselves uh, the target of developing any technology that is needed. Uh, whatever does not exist, we will generate as part of our research. And now this is very different from what Paul Jaffe did because in the tile he built, he simply used off the shelf component. And so there are enormous mass savings that can be achieved if you're prepared to design everything all at once, as we have done. And so this is a fundamental point. And then later on, I will emphasize uh, a point which I found extremely, um, extremely uh, subtle and, in fact, difficult uh, to, to think about the first time I read about it. There is an innovator in spacecraft structures architecture called Ivan Becky, who has written a wonderful book. And one of the things that he says is that we want to replace structure by information. That sounds like a wonderful way of producing lightweight systems because I hope that information will be massless, but I'll be telling you about that uh, later on. So um, in order to move forward, uh, the first thing that we need to do is to think about the basic architecture of this tile. Now, it turns out that uh, uh, perhaps rather obviously, uh, we can have four different kinds of architectures, but I don't want to go uh, to too many. I'll show you two examples. So let's begin with the simplest example, which is the one that was sketched earlier on in that overall uh, vision of the concept. So here we put a photovoltaic surface in orange on one side of the spacecraft and an RF, i.e. antenna uh, elements, on the opposite side. This is the easiest to think about, and in fact is the easiest to design. So we call this single-sided photovoltaic, single-sided RF. Then let's take another example uh, as shown here. It's identical to the previous one, but there is a new layer here, which is in gray, which is PV2. Now PV2 is some kind of magic RF transparent photovoltaic. Now when we started thinking about these magic uh, concepts, um, for a period we just thought about them, but actually as a team we are now in the process of building them. So it is not that magic if you think about it long enough. Um, so, okay, so here there are two concepts and I'll be showing you how they compare and are there advantages that would justify the development of this more difficult concept. Uh, um, will we get some real benefit that pays for the time that we'll spend working on it? And okay, so the obvious, other, the, the other two cases are quite obvious perturbations of these, um, uh, of these cases. 
Okay, so then the next thing that I want to mention is that I'll consider two kinds of systems. So another question now is, well, should we put this thing, the system, in geostationary orbit? Now, a geostationary orbit is a special kind of orbit which has an altitude of about 36,000 kilometers. And if we place um, a, um, a spacecraft in this orbit, then the satellite will appear to be stationary with respect to a fixed observer. So that is a particularly nice orbit to use for our study, and we will do that. But I will also consider another scheme where we use a medium Earth orbit, or MEO. And MEO, actually there's a wide range of MEO uh, choice, says because anything that is above low Earth orbit, uh, which is 2,000 kilometers, and below GEO is a MEO. So I will choose a particular MEO, and I will show you how that compares with a GEO. Uh, design. So, okay, let's continue then uh, this discussion. Um, I want to uh, consider now a geostationary orbit, and I want to define some key uh, parameters. So, one key parameter, the spacecraft is here, uh, one key parameter will be um, uh, with respect to the Earth, uh, the angle theta of the radius that takes me uh, to the center of the spacecraft. And uh, um, then uh, there will be a sun angle, beta, which is uh, the normal to the angle between the normal and the direction to the sun, the normal to the spacecraft, the direction of the sun. And also there is an RF angle, which is the angle between uh, the normal to the spacecraft and the center of the Earth. Okay, so this is the third angle. And then uh, nu is the true anomaly, uh, which is the position of the satellite in the orbit. So as it goes round, uh, nu. Uh, varies from zero all the way to 360, and it repeats. Okay, so there is one key question that we uh, posed uh, a while ago, and that is uh, how should we uh, vary uh, the orientation of the spacecraft, given that this spacecraft can only rotate itself. It's a one degree of freedom problem. Um, what uh, uh, is the orientation of the spacecraft as it goes round the Earth? Uh, how should it vary? And, uh, well, uh, more formally, uh, the problem can be posed as a guidance problem, uh, which is a, uh, in spacecraft dynamics is a problem of deciding how you uh, fly uh, the spacecraft. And uh, uh, what we need to think about is how much energy will be generated, or maybe instantaneously, how much power we can generate. So the power that is, is transmitted by the system will be equal to the power that hits the spacecraft, which is the solar flux, which is a fixed number, as I uh, showed right at the beginning, times some efficiency loss that we'll discuss later, and then times some geometric parameters, which are related basically to the projection of areas in two directions. One, the projection of the photovoltaic towards the sun, and two, the projection of the antenna towards the Earth. So these are the two parameters here. The product we call geometric efficiency. So if we want to think about uh, the most efficient way of flying the spacecraft and deciding how we should vary these angles, what we have to do is to study the variation of the geometric efficiency and maximize that. Okay, so here now you can see a comparison between the two um, the two tiles that I considered. The first one was the single-sided photovoltaic and the single-sided RF. And so, now this is quite intuitive. Uh, it is obvious that in this configuration, you point the PV to the sun and the antennas to the earth. Okay? It is also obvious that here, when we are in the opposite, uh, the opposite side of the Earth, there will be no power generated because we can generate power, but now the antennas are facing the wrong way. Okay, and then now what do we do in between? Well, in between, what we are trying to do is to keep the PV pointed towards the sun while also there is some RF pointed towards the Earth. And at some point, you can see the PV angle really becomes quite small, but still there is some area uh, projected to the sun, and hence some power can be beamed to the Earth. 
Okay, so this is the most basic design. Now, this contrasts the second design, which is the dual-sided photovoltaic. Now here, what we can do is essentially we can make sure that we are generating power pretty much all the time. And so here, there is the first photovoltaic surface that is pointed to the sun and gradually reduces its area. And then it's the second photovoltaic surface that is pointed, but now there is also RF capability on this side. So we continue to be able to both collect and radiate to the Earth. Okay, so you can see that the second design appears to be a lot better. So let's make a comparison now uh, in the, um, well, let's actually make a visualization of what I've been talking about. So what I am showing about here is um, uh, the uh, angle to the sun, the, the angle to the sun, the beta, uh, this anomaly which is varies between zero and 360 as the spacecraft goes around the orbit. And what we'll see is that it's a very simple maneuver, keeps going one way, then there is no power, and then it goes the other way. So here is the uh, efficiency, that geometric efficiency that I considered, and here is an animation of that spacecraft. So basically, you will be looking at the orange side of the spacecraft all the time, because uh, you or everybody in this room is actually to, looking from the sun. So the sun is here, and we're looking at the spacecraft. And we are looking constantly at one side of the spacecraft. Okay, now one thing that you can see is that the integral under the curve uh, which of, the, of this geometric efficiency curve, i.e. the area here and here, is really quite small because we would have liked to have 100% efficiency and then we would have liked to have a curve that runs at 100% and we've lost uh, a lot of that area uh, through this particular trajectory, which is actually the best possible with this design. So, Let's take the other design. Now the maneuver is going to be different, and in fact there will be two flips now that you will see in this uh, uh, type of orbit. And uh, uh, let me show you an animation of this spacecraft. So now we're looking at the orange side of the spacecraft. And now it flips, and that was this flip here. And now it's the second side, the PV2, that is collecting power. And it's collect, continuing to collect power uh, until, at this point, there will be a second flip. And here you have, again, the orange side of the spacecraft that is collecting power. Now, as you can see now, the area under the curve is not exactly 100%, but it's much, much higher than in the earlier solution. So you can see why we have chosen this particular set of tile designs to make the uh, this to provide this explanation. It turns out that really going to uh, dual-sided PV is a major improvement from the point of view of generating power, whereas going to dual-sided for both PV and RF has only advantages on fuel consumption uh, and no major advantages on power generated. So next, I'd like to discuss the alternative orbit that I described earlier. And so now I put myself here on the surface of the Earth. And uh, this orbit that I'm considering is a lower, uh, lower orbit. So the spacecraft is going to go faster. And uh, I want to make this problem simple. So I'm going to choose a particular type of meal that uh, um, provides two passes in one day, two orbits in one day. So this is a 12-hour orbit that I am choosing. And uh, for that, I need to choose a MEO uh, that has the following parameters. So now it's defined, it is not a circular orbit, so it's defined with a range of slant ranges, which vary between S max here and S min here. So these are the values, and this is about less than half, less, uh, a little, little, little over half than uh, the geo uh, altitude. Okay, so then um, what I do here is um, uh, to consider this orbit, and now I could initially think about having the spacecraft producing power from the point at which it appears on the horizon uh, here uh, all the way to here. Now, if, if that's the case, then uh, what I will need is extremely elongated 
uh, um, receiving antennas uh, on the ground because there will be a huge, hugely elongated projection. And so that is really not desirable. So in fact, what we like is to limit the range of angles much smaller. In fact, to 90 degrees by having 45 taking away 45 degrees on both sides. That means that at the center of the Earth, we are really using uh, a, uh, an angle delta nu, uh, a range of 72 degrees in the preferred design. So let me uh, show you now what happens in this case then. So first of all, um, the, uh, we will consider now two orbits. So that means from 0 to 360, and then the second orbit, 360 to 720. Now, an observer on the ground at a fixed location will see the spacecraft only when it appears, uh, uh, when it appears at 0 degrees, and then uh, it goes to 90 degrees, and then continues from 90 to 0. That would be the full range. Now, this is actually less than half the amount of time. So you could, in fact, uh, create a system that provides power continuously that includes three spacecraft. However, because of that angle restriction that I mentioned, the 72 degree restriction, we will, in fact, choose a constellation of five satellites. So now here is a detail of what happens here and here to uh, the spacecraft. And by, by the way, it's again a dual-sided photovoltaic, single-sided RF. So it's collecting uh, power and transmitting power to the Earth as a maximum if we don't worry about any constraints on the angle, um, on the angle of the spacecraft uh, up to here. And then there will be a second orbit during which, again, the spacecraft will be visible to the same point on the Earth, which by now has rotated there, and uh, uh, will be in this range. So at this point, with all this long discussion, uh, we are now ready to pose some fundamental questions. And the fundamental question, the first fundamental question is how do these two approaches compare and how do the two different tile designs compare? And okay, so uh, what I've told you about the MEO system is that we would actually like to have five, five systems in space. So it includes five satellites. And uh, so we will consider five satellites and versus the GEO system where there is a single satellite. OK, and uh, here now what we will do is um, uh, compute the day average of that geometric efficiency, um, which uh, uh, we uh, saw for the dual-sided spacecraft to be really quite high. We find that both the GEO and the MEO system have a, a day average of around 80%. So they are almost exactly identical in this respect. Um, of course, this doesn't mean that it's the same thing by any means, because one system includes five uh, sets of spacecraft and the other one, one. Okay, so that means that MIO would be more expensive in one respect. But of course, launching into MIO is much less expensive than launching to GEO. So the launch costs are different. Okay, so there are some more parameters to be discussed here, which I'll do shortly. But let me make a first comparison at this point. So this is a summary of how the system works uh, for the GEO design. So the solar flux is fixed. It's uh, uh, 1.36. One uh, kilowatt per meter squared. That hits the uh, single satellite that is dual sided in geo, and I make it uh, as large as I can uh, based on the distance, uh, the altitude from the Earth, as I explained from the antenna equation earlier on. So that is 730 meters by 730 meters. So this collected power is 730 megawatt. And then I have all these efficiency losses. Uh, first of all, the conversion of the photovoltaic uh, material, uh, PV material, uh, let's say 25% efficiency. Um, and then there is the conversion efficiency to go from DC to RF power, that is in the electronics and the antennas and everything else. So we will say 50% for that. And then there are the two geometric efficiencies, which are just because of the, the way we project areas uh, because of our spacecraft flying. And that comes down to a number of the order of 10%. Okay, now if I do this uh, over uh, the day, uh, then I will have 70 megawatt, uh, which is the average power going out uh, to the Earth, and then 84% percent of that power can be collected in the main lobe on the receiving antenna. And so I have actually received, uh, with a receiving station of one and a half kilometers squared, uh, 59 megawatt day average 
of power. Okay, so how does that compare with the Mio uh, case? Well, in the Mio case, uh, I can do the comparison in different ways, but the way I've done it here is that I consider five dual-sided satellites. So there are five of these, and each one of them is 550 meters by 550 meters. The dimension is smaller because the elevation is smaller for the satellite. And now, on each one of them, there is now 412 megawatt. And I do a similar calculation to what I did before. And I go all the way. And now the receiving station is a little more elongated because these orbits uh, are, uh, come down lower uh, on the sides of the horizon, towards the horizon. So that is elongated here in order to allow for that. And now I have 32 megawatt. But it is actually available at five stations, this power. OK, so this is now a complete description of the two systems. We still are missing the dollars uh, from this comparison. And so that is this slide. So here at this point, what we have done is the following. Uh, we have said, uh, let's consider some aerial densities that are either the aerial densities that we can think about right now, almost make them tomorrow. So that, is, that would be 600 grams per meter squared. That is the kind of tile aerial density that we are now confident we could do very soon. But we are actually targeting an aerial density of 160 grams per meter squared. So that is uh, the number I put here. And uh, then uh, as a stretch uh, to our current work, we will also consider 100 grams per meter squared. So then the next thing that we have to consider is this uh, concept uh, of the levelized cost of electricity. It means the following. I, I'm, if I'm going to set up a business that does this, I'm going to look at it as an investment, and I'm going to invest for a fixed amount of time, uh, the duration of the system, let's say 15 years, and uh, uh, I am going to build a number of spacecraft. And uh, in this particular concept, we do not replace the spacecraft uh, during the 15 years. But we assume that as the spacecraft are being built, uh, there is an improvement in efficiency, which is normal in these processes. And this is called learning. And so this is the curve for learning that we are using, which is saying that we are learning how to make the system more quickly, build the spacecraft more quickly and more efficiently. And we are learning at this rate. And then when we, when we halve the cost of building the spacecraft, then it becomes constant. OK, so this is the way these estimates were made. And with this uh, way of making estimates, uh, here is the uh, levelized cost of electricity for geo and meal. It turns out that geo is always a little bit more expensive. And meal is a little cheaper. Uh, and it is in the range of $1 per kilowatt hour to $2 per kilowatt hour. And, uh, um, uh, let me also point out something very interesting and significant about this, that if you look at the number of launches, how many launches of rockets will it take to realize the systems? Very different. So the GEO system uh, has, for example, 13 here versus MEO 39. So there are many, many more spacecraft and many, many more launches needed for the system because we are building five systems, as I mentioned. So now, going back to this question about this rate uh, between order of $1 to $2 for uh, kilowatt per hour, well, how good is that? Um, OK, so there are three data points that I can give you. One is that there is Wikipedia, and there is a table here uh, that tells you uh, the cost of electricity in many different places. And the minimum appears to be China, and the maximum appears to be you, the US Virgin Islands. So US Virgin Islands is half a dollar uh, per kilowatt per hour. And whereas in China is five cents. Now, another data point is that uh, uh, it has been reported that uh, uh, the cost of power to the U uh, US military in Iraq and Afghanistan was on the order of $15 per kilowatt per hour. And finally, I can tell you that my home, uh, home bill uh, is about 20 cents per kilowatt per hour here in Pasadena. So these are three numbers. And I think the first thing to say is that that estimate of $1 to $2 is not crazy. Uh, the second thing to say is that if you look at US energy consumption uh, last year, you will see that solar is a tiny, tiny fraction uh, of the renewable energy package. So really what we're looking at is obviously um, a, uh, a renewable energy source that is more expensive than the average type of energy production that we currently have in the US. So 
uh, this is some, some data points, and this is as far as we've got in these studies. So next, I'd like to turn to the next uh, part of this uh, lecture, and that is I would like to start talking about the structural architectures that we uh, are developing as part of our study. And uh, uh, the first thing to think about is how we will package these structures, given that it's so important that that 60-meter spacecraft should go into a relatively small rocket. So um, we take inspiration from nature. And uh, uh, there is a picture here of the moon flower. And the moon flower, as you can see, goes rather quickly from the bud to a fully deployed continuous petal. And uh, so this is the kind of thing that we want to be able to do. And uh, um, there have been examples, uh, particularly in solar sails, where early on, and indeed in recent years, uh, it's been proposed that we should package spacecraft by wrapping them. So just as in the moon flower, uh, this is a solar sail that would be wrapped. So this is what we would like to do. To, we would like to wrap, coil the whole spacecraft. And now we start thinking about how to do that. And uh, we read papers about origami. And that would seem to be the thing to do. Um, but it turns out that origami is not quite what we want to do. So uh, there is a problem with using origami for wrapping. So this is a series of fold lines. And I have folded a sheet of paper like this. But then I wrap it, as you see here. And I notice that the green side of the stack is now much shorter than the red side of the stack. And materials don't like to change uh, length by that much. And so here I look at what happens when I wrap this kind of thing on a cylinder, and I find lots of little buckles. And I don't like that, because I'm thinking about my spacecraft being damaged by the buckles. And I see all kind of other problems uh, as I look carefully around the package. So we came up uh, with a technique that is, again, uh, part of the general box of tricks that come from Japan. It's called kirigami. Now, kirigami is where you are allowed to make cuts in addition to folds. And so kirigami is the thing to do. So here is the idea. Now, we have the same folds as before, but these are different kind of folds than the one we had before. They are folds that allow rotation, but also slip. And so now, because we are allowing slip, then all of the lengths of these uh, different layers in the wrapped uh, spacecraft can maintain their length, and there will be no problem. So that sounds like a nice idea. But uh, you know, we're going to have bits of spacecraft here hanging loose, and we're not really happy about that. So here is a variant of that scheme, and it's shown here. So now we do exactly the same thing as before, uh, lots of slits or cuts in this sheet of paper. But now we leave the ends connected here at this end and at this end. And we fold, or rather z-fold, uh, the folds, as I described before. And now there is something magic in this coiled uh, spacecraft. And if you look carefully enough, what you'll see is that there is a reversal of curvature. So the curvature goes in one sense and then in the opposite sense. And that is what allows the ends to remain together, as you see in this picture. Let me show you another version of the same thing, actually done for a square. So here I have a square, and I have these fold lines of the type I've described before. And now I push on the edges of the square so that the, the edges becoming smaller. And finally, I keep pushing until uh, there is what, I, what is called a star fold. It means the shape of a star, and the whole of the square is now uh, packaged into four stacks uh, that are here, the quadrants of this shape. OK, this is another view of the same object. And now, if I coil this, then I obtain the uh, package that you saw earlier. And the reversal of curvature I described, you see it here. Look, this is convex, and this is concave. And basically, the same strip is folded, is coiled in one sense, half of it, and in the other sense, in for the other half. And by creating a package like this, we are able to keep the ends of the strips together. OK, so these are ideas. And uh, uh, now we need to have concepts also for how we will deploy the spacecraft. So the spacecraft, now we envisage putting this coiled thing that I described between eight rollers here. And we will now pull it out of the rollers along diagonal lines. And we'll keep pulling until the center is all deployed and it's all come out. 
And uh, when we've done that, uh, we will have some small paper loops uh, on the ends of this, uh, uh, on, the, on, the, on the sides of the, of the star. And uh, as we pull now further uh, at points A1 to A4, gradually we will break these paper loops and the structure will deploy. So that was the idea. And of course, we weren't sure it would work. So we built this. And the model that you're looking at is made of carbon fiber, actually. And uh, there are rollers, and there are constraints. And we will pull on the ends with four motors that run on tracks here. And uh, you will see various things that happen. OK, so now we are moving with the motors, and we are pulling out the four uh, ends of the star. And gradually, you see this package with the paper loops I talked about. And now uh, we need to remove the rollers. Uh, and we don't have an automatic way of doing that. So we are simply going to cut a rubber band. And now we've released the star. And now we're going to pull harder and break the paper loops to complete the deployment. And as you can see, uh, this is a structure made of carbon fiber, which is a very brittle material, and as everybody knows, and there is no damage. And uh, we package it very tightly, and we deployed it in a fairly autonomous way. But this was just the proof of concept for more work that needed to be done. But it justified further work uh, on this concept. So then the next thing that I want to talk about now is, well, this is a very simple model. But now uh, to go from here to the spacecraft structures, there are some more steps. OK, so what is the next step? So the next step is to design and build uh, some ultralight structure for the whole spacecraft. And of course, we're not going to build it at the scale of 60 meters. It's going to be much smaller. So, OK, so here is what we want to do. So this is the whole square module. And we envisage uh, a mechanism that is also the hub uh, for the spacecraft. Uh, and there we will have the whole thing packaged. We will deploy four booms, like I did in the uh, experiment uh, in the little demonstration I just showed. And uh, these booms will deploy diagonally. And every boom will have a cord, the blue cord, attached to it. And to this diagonal cords, four of them, we will hang a series of strips. And these strips are long and slender structures. And in fact, they look like this. They have two edges that we call longerons. And they have some uh, connecting elements that we call battens. And on the battens, we will attach the tiles. So now, uh, the longerons are very important because they need to be coiled. So we make them with a special cross section, which can be flattened and also coiled. And uh, uh, so this is what we want to do. Then the next thing we need is some very thin materials. And uh, we use the thinnest materials we can buy, uh, which come from a particular company in uh, Switzerland. Uh, they have an aerial density of 16 grams per meter squared. Uh, they are made by a process of spreading filaments of carbon fiber. And as you can see uh, here, uh, this is just a tape made of fibers all going in one direction. So this is our basic material. And uh, this is a structure that we have built, uh, which is 1.7 meter by 1.7 meter, is made of several strips, three strips, in fact, in each direction, and uh, uh, four sets. And the structure that we have built weighs 430 grams, and it has a, a flatness of one millimeter. You can kind of see it here in a vertical, uh, hanging vertically. And uh, I'll briefly describe the way we've made this thing. So the first thing we do is that we have some aluminum molds on which we put those uh, uh, carbon fiber uh, strips that I uh, told you about. And uh, uh, we set it up with a, a series of nonstick uh, material layers into a vacuum bag. Then we put it into the autoclave. And uh, um, this is a completed element that we have made. And here we are studying uh, on, under the microscope imperfections. We are measuring the weight. We are measuring the twist of the structure. Uh, we study the behavior of what happens to these elements when you coil them uh, on a cylinder, and things like that. And when we've done all of these things, uh, of course, uh, we have to check if they fly. So uh, I have verified. Uh, that these structures can fly. And in fact, I would like you to also witness uh, that uh, test. <laughs> no. 
Right. They do fly. Um, OK, now, of course, flying is not a, required, uh, not a requirement for the spacecraft design, but it is something that my colleagues in the aero department may decide to use for further work in their own areas. Um, so then there are other elements. Uh, the joints. So initially we made rigid joints uh, for that structure and later on we started thinking about joints that can be incorporated and coiled together with everything else. So this is our current design which is coiled on a cylinder. Then uh, we developed the process for assembling all these elements and forming strips. So here you have a metrology table on which we are bonding uh, various longeron elements with joints and buttons in this process, and this is a different view from the top of the same thing. And uh, when we've made all the strips, we measured their properties carefully, as you see here, and then we assembled uh, the structure, uh, the joints to the cords, and we built the complete structure. So this is one piece of demonstration uh, of uh, uh, the process of moving towards real spacecraft structures. Then the next piece is the deployment mechanism. Now, obviously, that rubber band cutting by hand was not ideal, and all the paper loops were even less ideal. So now, what kind of function uh, do we need to create within the mechanism, and how do we go about designing a mechanism? So we've worked extremely hard on this problem, and uh, uh, all kind of ideas have come from uh, interns and from uh, graduate students and so on. So the process of discovering how to do this is probably, I think, conceptually one of the biggest steps um, or one of the most difficult steps that we've made. So here we have rationalized the process of designing this mechanism. So we require the mechanism to provide four functions. The first one is packaging, which has to be reversible and also has to be automatic. Then stowing, it means that once we stow the structure uh, within the mechanism, we want the mechanism to hold the structure uh, without any damage and without uh, preventing, uh, preventing any localized deformation, so uniform coiling all the elements and things like that. Then it should provide the two components of deployment, which were unwrapping, which I demonstrated earlier on, and the synchronization of deployment, where all of the pieces come out. So basically, we need the mechanism to, to provide the packaging, the storage, and then the uh, unwrapping, and then the deployment. So these are all the functions we want from this mechanism. Now, I will talk mostly about the second part, uh, this part now, and uh, I'll begin by showing a design that we have produced. So now this is a design that we have produced, and it's kind of complex. There is, at the top, there is a mechanism that will release the whole part underneath when we are done with the initial part of unwrapping. Then there are captain membranes, or membranes that we use to contain the structure, which I will not show beyond this diagram. And then a whole load of cylinders on which we wrap things. And uh, uh, these cylinders are also hinged at the base so that they can get out of the way. And finally, there is a central motor here uh, that drives uh, both folding and deployment. Now, it's difficult to explain how the whole thing works, so I will show you an animation that will make it clear. Okay, so here we are more or less at the end of uh, unwrapping. We've now released uh, the mechanism, and now we are expanding the structure, and the structure is gradually taking its flat shape inside towards the outside. Now we look at the top, and it's the same process being repeated. Okay, so now we look at the details of uncoiling. So all those strips were coiled on cylinders and they are now uncoiling from those cylinders and they're being pulled out by motors which are mounted inside the four outer rollers. Then we've released the mechanism and now we look here at the structure at the end of deployment with this top part of the mechanism just above and the structure here all deployed in its plane. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is this tile. And uh, earlier on, I told you that we uh, had uh, the idea that we would develop 
tiles that would be integrated and made from, uh, conceived and built in a highly integrated way that would allow us to save weight. So what we have done is that over a period of over two years, the whole team uh, has worked on designing and realizing the first tile prototype, which we completed last year. So last year in May, uh, we completed a tile which was built and based on the, on the following concept. The photovoltaics are actually very narrow strips which are mounted uh, at the back of concentrators. So this is mirrors, this is a set of mirrors. Each one of these is a mirror surface that reflects the light on a narrow strip of photovoltaic material about one millimeter wide. And uh, uh, so this is the photovoltaic part. The antennas are underneath here in a separate layer. Let me show you a different view of this. We've actually built two models of this. The first one uh, has the photovoltaic plane and the antenna plane built separately and then integrated. And you see that here. So you have the mirrors that I talked about and the photovoltaic elements would be bonded here to the back of each concentrator. Then here uh, there is uh, just a conductor that takes us to the antenna plane, which really contains the two planes, the radiators and the ground plane. And of course there is an integrated circuit, which is the masterpiece of the whole thing, because it does the energy conversion from DC to the AC, and also it enables uh, uh, phase shifting for each one of the antennas. So that is extremely powerful integrated circuit and is tiny. So this is the first version, and then we try to save weight. So what we did was to integrate these two designs into a single one. So now what you have is that the antenna plane and the PV plane have been merged into a single design, and we were able to save a substantial uh, amount of uh, uh, mass by, by that, through that process. So when earlier on I was saying we have a process that very soon we could just build uh, tiles, well, it would be tiles like this. Uh, that we would build, and it would be just a little bit lighter than the ones that we built uh, previously. So here is the demonstration of this, of this tile. The tile is here, and this is a solar simulator, uh, which will be turned on, and we will demonstrate uh, PV uh, generation and RF transmission here. Okay, here there is an LED, there is a receiving antenna, that is receiving power wirelessly that is being produced by the photovoltaic part of the tile. So as you can see, it works if we vary the distance. Okay, so we will We will now show that the system is safe uh, for humans uh, by putting a hand uh, in between, uh, okay, in case uh, there were doubts about that. Actually, this is an important question that needs to be addressed. We are now demonstrating what happens if we rotate the receiving antenna. So this is simulating different angles between the spacecraft and the receiving antenna. And you can see that the, the LED is on throughout. So this antenna is uh, uh, not sensitive to the polarization. Okay, so uh, this is the demonstration of that system. And so uh, there is one last point that I did not cover, and that is how we replace structures with information. Now, I did not get the time to talk about this in detail, but I want to capture this key uh, thought. And the thought is that uh, uh, one, of the, one of the considerations, in fact, the consideration that made those systems of the past so massive is that they had to be stiff. And uh, uh, what you will have noticed is that the spacecraft I am talking about are not at all stiff. Indeed, they are so thin that in fact they are almost guaranteed not to be flat. So, okay, so if uh, the spacecraft is not flat, uh, well, what does that mean to this system? Well, it means that uh, in the case of our system, not only we will use uh, phase correction in the antennas in order to uh, steer the beam of RF, but we will also, in fact, take measurements of the, uh, the, differ the, the deviations from planarity uh, of the antennas with a system that is based on sun sensors. So we point sensors to the sun and measure angles 
uh, everywhere on the strips in order to uh, get data everywhere on the structure that informs us about uh, the shape of the surface at every local point. We reconstruct through software simulation the, uh, the shape of the spacecraft from that. And then we apply additional corrections in phase to the antennas that uh, uh, allow for uh, the fact that the actual shape from which the signals are coming out is non-flat. So this is the way in which we have managed to implement that suggestion of Ivan Becky that we should be replacing structures with information. So to conclude, um, I would like to summarize um, the material I have presented. So what I have done is to return to a topic that's been all open for 50 years, and I have presented a vision for space solar power that is new and perhaps uh, we think very promising. So the key pieces of this vision uh, are the constellation of identical ultralight modules, which are launched uh, in a tightly packaged configuration. I have shown that of two tile architectures, uh, the dual-sided photovoltaic and single-sided uh, RF uh, has about 30% advantage on single-sided uh, designs. Um, I have shown that this approach uh, can produce a system with a levelized cost of electricity in the range of one to two dollar per kilowatt hour, which is comparable uh, to other renewable energy sources. So this is the reason why uh, we as a team and as a space solar power project, we are continuing to work towards the advancement of the technologies that I have talked about and of some other ones that we did not have time to discuss. And we feel that uh, this vision is, uh, uh, has significant uh, potential. And uh, uh, the advances that I've described today in the design of ultralight spacecraft and deployment mechanism are also matched by similar advances that are being made by the other two groups, uh, Professor Atwater and Professor Hajimiri, that are working with us. And with that, I would like to thank um, uh, a number of people and organizations. I would like to thank the Northrop Grumman Corporation for funding uh, this research and the Space Solar Power Project at Caltech also for funding this research. I'd like to thank my collaborators, uh, which I've already mentioned. In particular, uh, the people that I have mentioned here are former students uh, and postdocs, and they have left the group uh, Manon is at JPL, Nicholas is at Stanford, Lee Wilson is in a startup in the Bay Area. Uh, these are current members of my group that have helped me with specific uh, material that I presented in this lecture, so I like to include their names here. And with that, I thank you, and I'll be happy to answer some questions.